The Tesla Model Y is the best-selling EV here in the United States, with about 170-ish thousand units sold last year in 2021. And Tesla themselves sell about 70% of all EVs, making them by far the most dominant player in this space, which makes sense, right? They kind of started this whole movement and have done nothing but EVs since, and so they just get better and better and you know more popular and more popular. That means that this car here is the gold standard. This is the one that you want to compete against if you're coming out with a new EV. Now, the interesting thing about this car is that the starting price, even today, is around $60,000. And so that's a lot more than the average person is willing to pay. Plus, it doesn't include things like a trailer hitch, changing the color or updating the interior at all. That's just the base price. Now, if you are coming out with an EV, this is what you're shooting for. And that's what Kia is doing here with their new EV6. This is the first Kia of the Plan S strategy, which is trying to completely change their look, modernize everything, and just make it more compelling and be very, very focused on electric cars. Now, the thing about this car is that the base price is $40,000. That right there would be enough or is probably enough for a lot of people to just decide which one they're going to go with if they want to go for an electric car. But the question is, though, does it compare? Is this still a functional vehicle? Is it a true crossover that's going to give you all the things that other gas powered crossovers are? And will it compare to this car, which starts at quite a bit more? Now, to be fair, the base price of this one is not really comparable to the base model of the Model Y. You do need to spend closer to $50,000. Still, that's a $10,000 difference. So the Kia EV6 I've had for about a week now as my daily driver, I've been kind of getting all the nooks and crannies and all the interesting things about it together. And this Model Y is actually my personal car that I've had for about two years. So today what we're gonna do is have a look at these two vehicles, see how they stack up, see if Kia is really got something special here or if Tesla and especially the Model Y is just gonna continue to dominate. Let's go. And that brings us to today's sponsor, NordVPN. One way that I've used Nord in the past is when I'm traveling and I'm trying to watch a show or a movie I like that may not be available in the country I'm in, but is available where I'm from. Nord allows me to tunnel my connection back to where I'm from and access all that content without any of the borders or restrictions that may be in place. Nord also helps you stay safe online by protecting you with next generation encryption anytime you have the service running. Nor doesn't track or collect or share any of your private data, as they say it's none of their business. So what you do is you pay for the service and then you have all of these features available to you. Nord has over 5,400 servers in 59 different countries, so you can truly enjoy the internet without limits or borders. And in times like these, access to information online can be critical to what you're going through. And so Nord is here to help. When you purchase a two-year plan, you're gonna get one additional free month plus a surprise gift. New users get this when they sign up at nordvpn.com slash bensullins. That also includes a 30-day money-back guarantee. So head over to nordvpn.com slash bensullins or click link in the description to learn more and sign up today. In the front of the Kia, you'll notice a lot of sleek lines, very tech forward, a lot of good stuff. I think it looks fine. But the one interesting thing I wanna point out is the front facing camera right here, which when you're in the car, allows you to actually see things as you approach them and automatically pops up, giving you kind of more visibility into that proximity sensor. Now, if I pop the frunk, what you're gonna see is something that contrasts with the Tesla pretty heavily. So here inside of the frunk, if you can call it that, is what you probably would expect from a gas car, honestly, lots of stuff. And unfortunately, that's this platform that they're developing, which means I don't think any of these models are gonna have a substantial frunk. There is this little cargo space here. You can open this little guy up and you'll get, I don't know, enough to maybe put a, a, a charging cable, some charging accessories. You can kind of see the height of it there. But, you know, something that I would say as an EV fan and lover and someone that's been driving them for years, kind of disappointing, but there is at least some space there in the front. And of course you have the front of the Tesla, which if you're familiar with is interesting. You know, it's one of those things that is, is kind of polarizing. Some people really hate the look of this, but I think it looks good. Now this one is a bit different. As I said, it's my personal car. We have these tinted headlights here and I've blacked out the uh, Tesla T to match the rest of the Chrome Delete. The major contrast really is when you open this up and you see kind of what's inside of the front there. And basically here, of course, you have just copious amounts of room. I mean, I've 
taking this on mini road trips. You throw shoes, jackets, full-size suitcases, all kinds of stuff here. This is really, really great in terms of putting stuff in there that you don't need immediate access to in the car, but it's just added cargo space. Here you can see the back of the cars. Of course, we know what the Tesla looks like with this nice little spoiler kind of built in and the big glass pano back. The Kia doesn't exactly have that same look. There's sort of like a little overhang, a little hat there for you over that. But there is still a nice sharp line giving it kind of a sleek look on the back. When we open up the back of the Tesla, you see that we have quite a bit of storage room. And I have this set up for my garage to where it doesn't bonk the garage. This is normally how big it opens. And here you have really just copious amounts of storage. And one thing that's really neat, I just want to highlight here, is how this centerpiece goes down. Because if you ever need four people, or in my case, two kids and two adults, with something running along the middle, like a surfboard, this is really useful. And it's not something that you see everywhere. You have this big area here, plus you have this big frunk area down here. My wife likes to get plants, so it's quite dirty. With this frunk area, I mean, this is a full-size gallon bottle. You can just see exactly how big this is. Huge amounts of storage. On both sides, there's also side uh, inlets like that. And then of course, if you pull this down and pull this up, there's even more storage in there. So tons and tons of room back here. It really is second to none. And then of course, if you want, you the seats can go down and you can put very large items. And notice the opening of the trunk here. This is sort of what I would call the aperture of it. This is where the Model 3 really falls down because the trunk opening is so small. Even though there's lots of room, you can't fit stuff here. Again, very functional, very useful. Not full-size SUV-like, but covering at least our most of our needs as a family of four. Now, the back end of the Kia is going to give you kind of a different look here. It still is going to have this really wide opening. If I push the button there. But inside here, you'll notice that it's not quite as good as the Model Y. So it is nice that it has this kind of gear guard thing, this little cover that covers up your stuff if you latch it properly. This can come out fairly easily just by pulling in on the little pressure sensitive bar there. It's kind of like a little pressure sensitive thing, easy. And then here you have kind of the major opening. Now you'll notice we have two car seats in here. Like I said, it's been our daily driver and they are reclined. Now the Model Y seats also recline. But here, there is no center pass-through. So if you wanted and needed to put something through there, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to do that. And here underneath the trunk or underneath this kind of false bottom, you have really not much space at all. It comes with a tire mobility kit. Underneath this is a subwoofer for the sound system. And this, this is actually something really cool that we'll get to in a second. But again, with the seats down, a fair amount of room, but overall, not really as good as the Model Y. The question is, is it good enough? That's really kind of the question about all these things. While we're back here, let's talk charging real quick. The charge port is hidden in here. You have to unlock the car, and then you have to tap on this guy, and it opens, giving you your J1772, pretty standard, and then this guy pops out to give you CCS, just like basically other every other EV in America, except for Tesla, of course. Now, there's some interesting things here about this. One, specifically, is that this has an 800 volt charging architecture, which just means that it, in theory, can charge extremely fast. And in fact, in theory, it can charge faster than any Tesla out there today. But with this, there's a lot of tech built into it. The only one that is kind of unique and different is this guy right here. This is their bi-directional charging. Now, what this is, they call it vehicle to load. And you pop this guy down, and what you have here is essentially a little outlet, a little 110 plug for us in North America. This guy plugs into there, and then you can plug things into here. It is kind of tricky as to how to unlatch it and get it all working, but um, I have seen this work at the, uh, the first drive event where they had a blender plugged into it. That is really cool. That means that this car has the ability to power light appliances and things. It's not something like the Ford Lightning that's gonna power your house, but no Tesla currently offers this. So I would say that is a cool feature and one that I think a lot of people will be excited about. Even if you don't use it that often, it's nice to know that it's there. And then when you wanna close it, you just push that little button there. So when you get in the Kia, you're greeted with this beautiful little welcome screen. There's this big binnacle dash here, or I don't know what you call it, just you know, two kind of screens on one little casing there, so they're actually separate. You have buttons to turn things on and off, which I'm not a huge fan of. I think Tesla 
just just is the right way to do it. Like you shouldn't need all these things. Kind of how, you know, Steve Jobs famously hated the on off switch on the iPod and all those kind of things. It should just know. So for me, how Tesla does this, I think, is far better. But it's it's a nuance. If you're coming to this from a gas car, you'll you'll not notice it. For but for me, it could be better. You push the EV power button, get a little message about confirmation. You have little touch buttons here. These are actually clicky buttons for things like a cooled ventilated seat, which is amazing. I love that that's a feature here. This is how you shift into you know rear neutral and drive. You have some buttons here for things like your cameras, which maybe I have to turn it on again. You have to push it twice. There you go. Now I can hit the power or the, the camera button and you can see what I have going on here. Let me turn that off so it's not bothering you. And then you have this 3D view, which you can see kind of cool as well. This is actually more useful than you would think. It looks kind of weird right now because I'm parked right next to a car. But if you're somewhere trying to get into a kind of a tight or nook or cranny, you can kind of see all around it. It's actually really cool. And then this is the 3D view there as well. And as I mentioned before, you can see in front of you. Now, I like that you have these manual controls here. And this little bar here, which is just basically the, 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 the you know, configuration for this as well as your climate controls. Super useful. I love that it's not embedded in the screen. These screens are dedicated for what they are and it actually just works beautifully. So I can turn that on, cool off for a second, turn my cooled seats on and I still think it's a really nice interior. Now as far as the rest of the interior goes, I think these materials are really nice. You've got a lot of functions on the, the steering wheel, which I, I like, and you'll get used to them. For me, it's a bit clunky coming from a Tesla with very little buttons and knobs and things. But overall, as a driver, I think they've done enough to make it modern and tech, but also still kind of very functional to where you're not having to hunt through menus to change the AC and dumb things like that. So it's a comfortable layout. I've been driving in it for about a week and I really like it. Um, this whole center console I think could just be kind of removed. I like the big bottom down here, but again, all these buttons and things you could easily put here or embedded in stocks or something. It doesn't need to be there. But overall, it's open, it's tech, I like it. And one thing that this car opened my eyes to that I wasn't aware of before because I've been driving nothing but Teslas for six years is Apple CarPlay. I'm actually new to Apple, but they also have Android Auto. And essentially you plug your phone in to, you know, and you have to do it wired for some reason. I'm not sure why you have to do a wired version of it, but you plug your phone in and then all these apps and all the preferences and things that you have are just automatically displayed on the screen. I think I have to turn off the uh, the cameras here and you can see here exactly what's going on. So for example, on the screen, I have all these apps and things like my custom uh, podcast player, Pandora, Waze, WhatsApp. I mean, I have all the plug share, all these apps that are super useful that are on my phone, but not in my car. And now when I look at my Tesla, I kind of think like, damn, you guys should have this. Like, this is actually better. I will say that maybe the design of it is different and the user experience is probably better. But the fact that in a Tesla, I don't have choices for what music player I want. I don't have apps for things like a better route planner or charge point or plug share. To me, that's a, that's a downside. So just by allowing Apple CarPlay, I feel like Kia has kind of one up to Tesla in that regard. Another thing that isn't an option on this car, but is on the one that I drove up in Sonoma at the first drive event was a heads up display. So right behind kind of in your, your foveal vision, right where you're, you're looking, you can see, you know, your turning, your speed, all those kind of things. And I, I like that, I miss it, I do. But even without it, I think it's still fine. I'm, it's not something I'm used to, but it is an option you can get on this car. And I really like that. And in the back of the car here, we have our kids' car seats. One of them's kind of a booster, and one of them's kind of a bigger one. But it's just to show that there is quite a bit of room back here. I took a, one of my friends in this for a drive who is six foot two, and he did have a hard time with the headroom. His head was just totally bumping up against this. So I think that has to do with the sloped back, whereas the Model Y is a bit more bulbous. It, there's a lot more headroom there. So if you're a taller person and you're going to be sitting in the back of this car, that might be a problem for you. But it is kind of neat how you have these little USB ports it's on the side and it's just a you know a good amount of foot room as well as these seats do recline so plenty of room for two kids in car seats i would say uh, with the exception of you lose a lot of the storage there where the model y kind of you know still has all that extra room but overall plenty of room for most adults and not bad for kids either 
Here's a little thing you use just to uh, adjust the seat so you, these can actually recline in here, which is kind of nice. Gives you a little bit of extra room. There really isn't any foot room below the seat, which is kind of lame. It's like not great right there, but you know, you do have is still just a, a lot of left to right room, so not terrible. And then of course, as I mentioned, here is this little USB port that they have in there, which is kind of nice. And then in terms of rear air, rear air comes from these guys here, not from a center thing. So this might be hard for kids to reach if they're trying to do it, but it is there and it, you know, still a pretty comfortable ride overall. Okay, here in the Tesla, the Model Y. If you're unfamiliar, essentially Tesla has removed all the buttons and knobs and put everything into this screen here. And with the user interface changes, they've been hiding a lot of these things, which I think make it more difficult to find things like a heated seat or how much air is going or where the direction of your HVAC system is going, as well as it doesn't have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, which means you're limited to the apps and you know music navigation systems that they want you to use. I think for what I would consider the most tech forward car out there, that's, that's a miss, that, 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 that's a fail. And the Kia definitely wins in that regard, which is kind of ironic that Kia just basically throws up their hands and says, yeah, we'll try to build in this little thing, but we'll just let Apple CarPlay do it. And Tesla says, no, we're gonna you know, make it and it's gonna be so advanced and great. And Kia wins because they have more apps. They have a better tech interface, I feel. And so, you know, if you're a technophile that likes that stuff, you may disagree, but I think most people would get into the Kia and feel at home and comfortable with it. Whereas here, it's gonna feel just stark contrast to anything you've else, anything else you've ever driven. They've also, you know, you have two little knobs here, two little stocks here, two little knobs, no other buttons to speak of. You do have a couple wireless chargers, which is nice. A good center console storage unit there, another one here, some cup holders. Overall, this isn't bad, but having the lack of CarPlay or Android Auto, meaning you're limited, and then also not having a heads-up display or a second screen behind here to take, say, this whole section of driver information and put it there, I think is a miss. So I would have to give Kia the, the, the point here in terms of the, the user interface, the driver interface, and just this overall layout. And so here in the back, the thing to note is, yeah, sure, the car seats fit essentially the same as they do in the Kia, but the headroom here is quite a bit better. And that's what you get when you look up and you have this glass roof right here, which adds a couple inches because the actual frame of the car just goes up and it gives you that added room. Now the Kia does have this, but not in the back. So if you're a taller person or if you have taller guests and you plan on sitting in the back, in the Kia, you're not gonna be nearly as comfortable as you are here. Both vehicles actually have rear seats that recline, which is kind of cool but you know, not super useful. Um, it is something that I guess is somewhat unique. Really for us, that just means easier positioning of kids' car seats. And then again, as I mentioned, that center piece does go down, which gives it kind of a unique edge over the Kia. And then at least in this version, there are vents right in the middle with a couple USB ports, a lot of extra room there. You can see our kids kick and make the seats super dirty. But the, the interior, the back, I think, you know, they're pretty comparable, uh, not too much difference there. But, you know, making maybe having the vents here is a little bit easier for, for little ones. All right, guys, back here in the studio. And I think it's important always to look at the specs of these and really do kind of like just run through the numbers side by side. So first, let's start with one of the most important categories, I think, is price. Right now, according to the Tesla website, we're looking at about $62,440 for the base Model Y, the, the long range edition that they sell. Now in California, or at least where I live, we can calculate the taxes and titles and fees as well, which come out to about $5,600, giving us a total right around $68,000. So then if you put 5,000 down and you had 3.11% uh, APR right now with a 72 month loan, which seems absurd to me, you're looking at about $960 per month. Of course, this doesn't cover all the other things like insurance and maintenance and fees and fuel and whatever, but let's just assume that between these two cars, those are about the same. And then as far as the Kia goes, I would recommend getting the wind rear wheel drive, which gives you 310 miles of range, which is comparable to the Tesla. Now this one comes in at about $48,215. Then you add the tax title license fees of $4,500 and you're just shy of 53,000 out the door. You apply the same loan terms and you're looking here at about $727 per month. 
And when it comes to range, the Model Y is reporting 318 miles, but they also say you can get up to 330 depending on the tires. Kia EV6 wind rear wheel drive gives you 310. And both of these are just numbers at the OEM states. If you're new to EVs, there's also this factor that I don't think a lot of people know of, which is that you don't charge to 100% every night, which means when you get up in the morning, you're not gonna see your car say 310 or 318 or any of that. It's gonna be quite a bit less depending on your daily charge limits. So these are more kind of the overall max possible range in a best case scenario, which to me just means that there's a lot of variability and I would call these essentially even in terms of how far they can go on a single charge. Now, when it comes to charging, of course, Tesla is known to be great here and it's actually really good. With the Tesla Model Y, the one I have, the one I've been driving for a long time, we went on several road trips here and at the Tesla V3 fast chargers, these are the fastest ones that they make, we've got around 250 kilowatts in terms of the speed of energy coming in, which allows us to really stop for 15, 20 minutes on a charge and keep going. So it's actually really quick, really efficient. It's not much worse than just filling up with gas in terms of time stopped. Now the Kia does have this 800 volt architecture, which should allow it to charge even faster than the Tesla. And in my testing, it doesn't quite get there. The closest I got was right around 240 kilowatts at a station that can go up to 350 kilowatts. Now, all that said is both of these cars charge incredibly quick. The Kia, I did note that when it was charging at that super high rate, it was doing so at a 50% state of charge and above, which is the Tesla really only gets that rate when it's about between 20 to 30%, and then it drops down significantly. The thing is though, that it doesn't really matter. Like both cars get a ton of range really quickly. If I were on a road trip, I would feel good about having either one of these cars in terms of their ability to charge quickly. Of course, the thing that Tesla has that the Kia doesn't have is the supercharger network. So Tesla supercharger network is plentiful and simple and easy and just works. It's great. The EV6 uses Electrify America plus many other ones like ChargePoint and EVgo and a bunch of others. So the Kia EV6 does have options out there, but they're not as kind of seamless as the Tesla supercharger network. So Tesla definitely gets the point on the charging network, but in terms of their ability to charge, I would say that they're an even match. And really, if you're new to EVs, again, you're just gonna be charging at home most of the time. In fact, if you don't have a place to charge at home or at work, that's where it actually becomes more inconvenient to own an EV. So think about that if you're going down this route, like do you have a place where you are gonna be at for several hours a day that you can charge? If so, the charging networks and all this really only come into play when you're going on road trips. So just think about that, you know, it matters, but it's probably not as big of a deal as some people make it out to be. Now, when it comes to performance, the Tesla wins, hands down. The, the off the line acceleration is fantastic and it continues to go. And this is the long range Model Y. This isn't even the performance one and it's nothing like the Model S with the Plaid and all that. So the performance on the Model Y is fantastic. Now, the performance on the Kia is good, but it definitely is not as good. So if you're coming from a gas car, you will get in the Kia, go into sport mode, and you, you know, your face will be blown off because it's so incredibly amazing. But if you're looking at these side by side and acceleration, that off the line performance is important to you, I would have to give the point to Tesla. It just, it just handles it so much better and it continues to pull. Whereas the Kia really has that strong pull off the line and then it really kind of falls short. Now handling is the other thing, right? So if you're driving on a twisty road, where are you going? And I actually did this in the Kia EV6 on my first drive up in Northern California, where we went for a few hours on these windy roads through Napa Valley and up there, I will say the Kia didn't do very well. It, it definitely did not give me confidence that I could just kind of rip through these mountains and I wasn't gonna slide off. Now, the Tesla also has that same feeling. I've driven Teslas through a lot of mountain roads and with the exception of the performance models, the suspension and handling and the body roll, you would say, on most of the other models, including the Model Y, is not great. It's fine for your daily driving, going to work and back, the grocery getting type stuff, but if you're really looking for a performance car, I would say neither of these do that well. And so I would just call them a wash in terms of driving experience and handling. Now related to the driving experience, you have what's called ADOS, an Advanced Driver Assist System. Kind of, it's kind of a lame acronym, but basically this is your self-driving, you know, put that in quotes because it's not actually self-driving. Neither of these cars, to be clear, are self-driving vehicles. They have driver assist programs or systems that make it 
easier and take some of that stress off of you. Now, Tesla, famous for autopilot, works incredibly well. We'll just say the basic version of autopilot, the one that comes with the car, I think is great. I think the lane centering, you know, actually keeping you in your lane as basically driving on the freeway, speeding up and slowing down with that traffic aware cruise control in Tesla is second to none. I think it's the best out there. But it is also very comparable to what I've experienced in the Kia. And I've had a lot of time to test this. And I will say that it works almost as good as Tesla Autopilot. The one thing that's different, I would say, is that on some other, some roads where it might be hard to see or it might not know what it's doing, it will drift quite a bit more than the Tesla. But in terms of just, I'm sitting back, the car's kind of handling the road for me, they both work incredibly well, and I would call them evenly matched. And availability is another thing to think about. I mean, how soon do you want this car? Today, as I'm recording this in February of 2022, there are about nine Kias available at dealers around me here in Southern California, which means I could go, in theory, buy this today. Now, there's probably going to be a dealer markup. Kia is kind of the worst at doing dealer markups, but still, a couple grand here or there. You know, if you needed a car today, it's available. Now, with Tesla, according to the website today, I'm in February and we're looking at August for the earliest delivery. Now, of course, this will change. And you know, depending on when you're watching this, this uh, you know, all this may be sorted out. But there's a lot going on in the geopolitical space. There's a lot going on that has been disrupted in the supply chain space for the past couple of years. So, you know, if you need a car sooner or later, you're probably going to lean towards the Kia, depending on where you live. Or if you're just in love with Tesla, you're fine waiting, you know, you can put your money down and then just, you know, see what happens with there. And a new category that I'm adding here is reliability. Now, Teslas have been known to have a lot of quality issues. Basically, since about 2018, my own experience, every Tesla I've had since then has had a lot of quality issues and the service center can't always fix them. Getting into the service center can be difficult depending on where you live. Parts availability can be really difficult. So when it comes to reliability, I would say Tesla has a long way to go. They, they definitely are not uh, the top tier in any, any regard. Now, Kia, on the other hand, does rank the highest in the JD Power reliability study. Plus, they have tons of years of experience and lots of dealers out there. So it's a thing where if you were to look at these just objectively from a reliability standpoint, I think the Kia is probably going to come out ahead. But I will say, having dealers in your neighborhood doesn't necessarily mean that those people are trained on this. And it also, this is a whole new technology. This is a whole new platform for them. So it's not like, you know, the Telluride or something they've been making for a long time where they've really kind of perfected it. So we'll have to see and kind of wait, but just, you know, objectively stepping back, Kia is definitely one of the highest like reliability ranked companies and Tesla is definitely not, even in my own experience, plus, you know, all the experiences and data you have out there online of people sharing these stories. And of course, I always want to include my wife Jenny's opinion on this as she's been driving the Model Y as her daily driver for almost two years now. And so here's what she has to say when thinking about the Kia compared to the Model Y. Okay, yeah, so compared to the Model Y, the Kia drove great. I mean, it, it was really similar in the sense that it has the the EV kind of initial acceleration just really quick to pick up, especially when you get on a freeway. So yeah, I felt like driving was really safe. I liked the height of it. I felt like it wasn't, like if you've driven the Model 3 or the Model Y, how different they are, like the Model 3 sits really low on the ground. The Kia, I felt like it was much, maybe not as high as the Model Y, but it sits up. So I really enjoyed driving it. It felt really easy to kind of transition from each one. The back seat in the Kia felt very spacious to me. I know we had talked a little bit about whether it was or wasn't, but the interior was really light and we had a light gray interior. So everything just felt really open and spacious. I have a dark interior in my Model Y, so I don't know if that makes the back feel a little bit tighter. The Model Y I feel like has good space for your feet, um, but I felt like the Kia had really good space between the two car seats and also my, my driver's seat being able to go back and forth. So I felt like there was plenty of space in there. The trunk, um, I feel like the Kia has good space, but I prefer the Model Y for the trunk space. The not having that little yacht bottom, I don't know if it's yacht bottom, that might not be the right term for it, but it has that little bottom below the trunk and the back that you can lift up. That's like, I use that all the time in the Model Y. Not having that in the Kia, it definitely, I missed it a little bit. I do feel like they could add a little bit more space back there. But as far as having a hatchback and being able to use that space, it was plenty of space for me. I think there is more space in the Model Y regarding the trunk area. As far as the front, like, 
you know, the, what do you call it? The dashboards and mm. what do you call those things? Binnacle dashboards, <clears throat> just, just the dashboards, the screen. Yeah, so the, the, interior, inter layout. the interior layout and everything. I like it. I, I actually prefer the two dashboards. Um, I was gonna say, so with the Model Y update, you now have the like, you, you turn your blinker on and it has the little camera and you can see it. I really don't use it. It's just a little bit out of my eyesight for, and I just don't use it. And the Kia, I was surprised that it had it. And so every time you turn the blinker on, it pops up a little camera right in front of you on that binnacle dash. And I thought that was a really nice feature and I really enjoyed it driving with that. But as far as driving it, I really enjoyed it. I actually, like the analog options. I liked being able to, I really miss being able to change my direction of the airflow just by like moving it. So I do like that part of the Kia that there is a good amount of tech and kind of forward moving kind of design to it, but also I have a lot of like tangible things that can touch and move and it doesn't feel like a big jump. When I think of going to an EV, there are still a lot of people that don't need all that kind of minimalist tech kind of futuristic feel. And so this seems like a nice easy jump from like a gas car to a regular car. That's kind of what I kept thinking when I was in it. I was like, I could see the people that have felt standoffish that I know in my life that have been like, oh, they get in a Tesla and they're just like a little bit weirded out. And they were like, oh, I could never drive this. It's just too foreign to them. And um, I just think it would be an easy transition for them to that because it still felt like a, a car. Any quirks to the Kia? Yes, that compared to the Model Y. Now, remember, I've been driving a Tesla and a Model Y for five-ish years. So these could be just normal quirks that are in other cars too. But the car, having to turn the car on and off, I pretty much for a week straight left the car like on. I mean, there was just, it made no sense to me that there was a button because in a Tesla, you just get out and the car like powers down, you know, it's kind of like a laptop, like you walk away and it goes to like screensaver mode. So the car needing to be turned on and off, I just felt like it, that would take a little second to get used to. I even have a friend that has a hybrid Kia. It runs so quiet that she's done the same thing to it the first two months she had it. So obviously that's something you would get over, but it was just, I felt like it was one thing I didn't need. Um, Okay, the sounds on the Kia. I don't like them. And I know this is like a California thing and you have to have safety, but I felt like I was driving a garbage truck. Every time I'd back up, it'd go beep, beep. I really didn't enjoy the sound. I don't know really what else to say about that because it's probably a law and you have to have it, but my Model Y does not have it. The version I have or the new Model Ys maybe have a different sound. And th that's something I just really, the the sounds of it turning on and the sounds of it backing up, I could do without those. So regarding the two cars, the Tesla Model Y and the Kia EV6, I think both are great options. My personal choice, I would go with the Model Y just because A, I know it, it's comfort. I do like the little added storage to it. I love driving that car. Um, but there's a lot of things I don't like about the Model Y that I think would be really easy just simple switches back and forth, right? Like some of the tech, some of the constant changing of it. For people that don't really have this like brand affinity with Tesla and they don't feel tied to one brand, the Kia would be such a good recommendation. I would recommend it to anyone who was looking for an EV that has a hatchback, good, like good range. Range is huge in the EV world. That's kind of what you really want to focus on. The other stuff is just styling and comfort. I did really like the interior of the, the Kia. I would totally choose that interior again. I thought it was really nice. And the little bells and whistles of like the chimes and the backup stuff, I'm sure you'd get used to. That was just maybe why I would choose the Model Y over that. I think probably between the two, it would really come down to price and maybe just final styling on each car. Because as far as the storage and performance, I know probably Ben would say performance was much better and I, I would agree, but I think they could be comparable. And I agree with what she's saying. Overall, both of these cars, I believe are solid picks. If you want more performance and maybe more storage, the Model Y is gonna be the winner, but with that, you're gonna be paying quite a bit more. So if you're looking for something more practical, more budget friendly, that still is a really great pick. The Kia is a great choice. 
And if you wanna see videos, more deep dives into either of these, check out one of these videos here as I've done full reviews of both of them. And stay tuned here for more on the channel as I'm getting a bunch of new EVs coming in and we're gonna be doing lots of comparisons like this and lots of deep dives. So thanks for watching guys. Let me know what you think in the comments down below and I'll see you back here next time.